Thank you, Yakub. I, I have to admit, I never, ever, ever use slides, but out of deference to the success of PDF and Andrew, and because Yakub asked so politely, I actually did ha do slides. But there may be some clip art and things in there. So uh, I, I always like to give presentations to just try to be honest. I feel like it comes, it's a little bit more entertaining that way. So part of the honesty of this presentation will be me dealing with my own slides, because I never, ever use slides. Uh, so. First of all, thank you for having me here. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to spend two days with you all hearing about your experiences. It's difficult for me to come up and present on our experience after, after being inspired and, and really understanding some of what's happening. I mean, I try to follow it from a distance, but to hear some of the stories today it makes my job pretty difficult coming in last and trying to tell the story of what's happening in the US. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to try to tell a couple of stories about some of the fights that we're involved in at the Sunlight Foundation and some of what we've been doing. Uh, talk a bit about some good news, some things where we've made some progress, some bad news, which I think you'll all probably be familiar with most of that, but there's some pretty big bad news coming out of the US, and then use that to try to make a couple of generalizations or conclusions about what's happening. Uh, so yes, there's the clip art, Uncle Sam. I found out that there's, there, there was another version of Uncle Sam called Brother Jonathan, which I'd never heard of before. I learned that on Wikipedia today. So it's, history is bizarre sometimes. OK, so there have been a lot of, of recent wins. Uh, the one I wanted to start with, because I know that many of you are probably involved in the same issue, uh, is open data. And so the, the US, in many ways, had a big, league, big lead in working on open data at the federal level. Uh, and the Sunlight Foundation has been very involved in that since before Obama ran for office and was talking about data, and then from 2009 until now, helping to refine and perfect the open data policies. Uh, so, yeah, missing part of the slide. Told you it would be honest and entertaining. Um, the point here is that the open data policy that the Obama administration put into effect in 2009 and then 2011, there are like 10 of them, which is a good problem, I think, that they're perfecting it over time. The most recent improvement that they've made to the open data policy requires every agency to make a list of every data set that they have, regardless of whether it's sensitive or whether it's not public. They don't have to release all of their data, but they have to make a list of every data set that, that they have. And then since 2013, 2012 or 2013, uh, we have been, we submitted a FOIA request to get access to those lists of all the government's data. And it was only a few months ago that finally, when we threatened to sue the government over the FOIA request, they started to take us seriously, the gears started to grind, and finally, every agency is now starting to release their comprehensive lists of all the data that they have. And this, to me, is sort of the next frontier in thinking about what open data is. It's very often, let's release what's comfortable, or let's make a list of what we already release. And so for us, we're trying to take open data to mean being able to manage and make good decisions about what should be public with the comprehensive view of all the data the government has. Uh, it's going to be a long-term fight to make sure that everything is included because we have lots of fears about anything to do with national security or intelligence, so certainly those lists are going to be incomplete. But I think it's a big step forward because now we're able to go agency by agency and audit their list of data and try to make them more, more complete. So that's one thing that I'm really excited about is that we've gotten comprehensive lists of agency's data sets, and that we used FOIA and a lawsuit over the FOIA in, or, uh, in order to get that released, or the threat of a lawsuit. Uh, second, FOIA reform is on its way. This might be cheating. This, this is sort of mixed news. I don't know that it's quite good news. Um, a number of different revelations over the last few years about how our Freedom of Information Act works uh, have led to building political pressure to reform it and to strengthen that law. Last year, uh, the House and the Senate both passed new laws to strengthen the FOIA, but they weren't the same. And there was disagreement between the chambers, and so it didn't pass, and, and the reform didn't happen. Um, it turned out that part of the reason it didn't pass was that the Obama administration was opposing the bill. The agencies were all lobbying Congress in secret, saying that if this, this FOIA reform passes, there would be harm and, and they wouldn't, their lawyers wouldn't be able to talk to agency officials and just sort of scaremongering what there is broad political consensus should pass. Uh, so that FOIA reform is still moving through the Congress. I think there's a very good chance that it passes this year. 
And you know, we're in a pretty good situation with the FOIA. Our, our Freedom of Information Act is almost 50 years old. Overall, it's very successful with a few very notable shortcomings, especially around surveillance and human rights and military issues. And the, the things where American political and state power are the strongest are the places where our FOIA is the weakest. And that's part of what we're trying to correct through these reforms, which is an uphill fight, but it's for the most part working. So yes, mixed news in the good news category. Um, one more piece of good news is net neutrality. Uh, now this wasn't entirely Sunlight's fight, but it's something that we agree with wholeheartedly, and we're glad that there are other organizations that have led the way in terms of fighting for, for net neutrality. Um, and so when the FCC recently announced the new net neutrality policy, this reversed what was coming to be uh, a terrible example of yet another money in politics story, another example of a regulatory agency that was captured by the interests it was intended to control. And then over the last year or so, the tide reversed and it started to become clear that the FCC was making room to release a more progressive policy. Uh, so my, my good friend Matt Stoller described this new policy this way. Uh, he called it the reemergence of po populist politics into the industrial sector and the first significant anti-monopoly principle affirmatively put into legal force since the 70s. And I think those are both really strong ways of describing how shocked many of us were to see such a progressive policy come from the FCC, even under Obama. It was amazing this, that this managed to happen. So that's great news. Um, and it's also great news because those of us who work in civic technology and on transparency have to understand that the things that we're trying to change are only going to be as strong or as beneficial as the internet is free and equitable and, and easy to access. And so if we have an unjust or uh, unevenly distributed or unfair internet, that's the best we can hope from our civic, uh, from, from our civic technology. So that limitation is terrifying and it's great that we were able to ward off some of the worst of what was happening. Um, I would be tempted to put into the same category other issues like uh, free speech or literacy or feeling secure in your person or having free time enough to read about a policy or attend a government meeting. I think sometimes those concerns get less consideration than they deserve, especially at, in American NGOs. Um, but this was certainly a big step forward and good news for us. Um, all right. Fourth piece of good news is that open data policies in American cities uh, have spread like wildfire over the last two years. And Sunlight has been deeply involved in that. We had dedicated staff. Uh, we, th we thought, so we, we designed principles and guidelines for how open data policies should work in American cities. And we thought that we were going to have to buy av advertising and figure out how to do a media push to get cities uh, to pay attention to this idea of open data. American cities, it turned out, were more interested in passing open data policies than we had staff to deal with it. So there were several people whose job it was just to answer the phone and respond to emails from city officials, from mayors or city council members who were saying, we want to pass open data policies. Please read the text and tell us how to make it better. Uh, so that enthusiasm, um, now you can say that open data is sort of an easy commitment to make, and that's in some ways it is, but still this is a really strong expression of a cultural value, of something that is changing and that's taking root. And the, the fact that it's so strongly held throughout American cities across the country, for us, I think that's very reassuring because that message hasn't yet made its way to the federal level. So change often trickles up. You see that in other social issues in the US like gay marriage or drug reform. And I think the same is true for transparency and how that's progressing. All right, so those are the pieces of good news. Uh, again, with the clip art, uh, Uncle Sam and the frowny face. Uh, so th there, there are some issues that we're involved in that are, that are deeply troubling and, and are uphill battles, some of them losing fights at the moment. Um, the first one, uh, I'm not going to talk about money in politics yet, although that is one of the pieces of bad news. I, I just wanted to mention the Hillary Clinton email scandal that just happened. Um, I had... Uh, the un I don't know, maybe it was fortuitous. I was one of the people that wrote a blog post about the New York Times story right when it went up, and I completely underestimated the amount of public attention that that would draw. Th this story inhabits a very unique place where it's about presidential politics, 
but it's not about what somebody said on the campaign or who ate at Chipotle or whatever silly campaign news is of the day. This was about Secretary Clinton's four-year tenure as the Secretary of State. Uh, so it's a government reform story cast through the lens of presidential politics that meant that NGOs have a, a responsibility th to think about it. Um, so the short of the story is that Hillary Clinton designed a system to avoid having to give anyone access to her emails when she was Secretary of State, even though the law says that they're clearly public records. When, this, when it became clear to her that this was going to be discovered because of Congressional Oversight or Freedom of Information Act requests, she deleted all of them and then said, sorry, they're all deleted because it's my personal information. I'm sure you'll understand that I got rid of them. Uh, I raised this for, for two, I mean, this is, again, mixed news. In a sense, this is good news because everybody cared about it and everybody was talking about it. In a sense, it's bad news because presidential politics means that the discussion was all about whether it would hurt her election chances and not about the question of the Federal Records Act or the Freedom of Information Act or how to prevent this from happening or Congress and, and its oversight duties. So this is another piece of, of mixed news to me. Um, second issue, surveillance. Uh, there's Edward Snowden. The picture on the right isn't actually the one that I wanted. The, the picture that I'd love to show you, you can Google it though. One of the intelligence agencies, when they were trying to get funding from Congress, built a full-scale replica model of the Starship Enterprise with a big chair in the front where you could pr pretend to be Captain Kirk. And the whole idea was to bring members of Congress into the bridge on the Starship Enterprise, and then they could view huge television screens with data in front of them and feel powerful. The whole idea was to make members of Congress feel powerful by giving this, them this ridiculous movie set-like bridge on the Starship Enterprise. There was no accountability for that. It was embarrassing when that story was told in the media. Uh, but that's a good, I mean, I, I don't have to tell you all how bad American surveillance is and how we're exporting it around the world and how it th threatens the nature of the internet. I think that's a familiar idea. Um, but the impunity is so bad that officials think it's a good idea to build replicas of spaceships in order to lobby Congress, and they don't get in trouble for it. So that's just my example of uh, bad news and what I consider a t totally an uphill fight. All right, so that's surveillance. Last piece of bad news is that our money and politics problem in the U.S. is getting worse and not better. A string of bad Supreme Court decisions and their interpretations has caused an arms race between the parties. Uh, the, the next presidential election is forecast to cost something like $6 billion, and anything we have uh, resembling public financing or transparency requirements is slowly being gutted by regressive court decisions and, frankly, the, both parties that have stopped believing in it for now. Um, so that's an, an issue that's going to get a lot worse before it gets any better. Um, so, to try to abstract out from all of that in two minutes and, and have some sort of generalization that's useful, um, one thing I want to say is that that's, this set of issues is one reason that international coordination is so important and is something that makes me really enthusiastic about being involved in this work. I think the kind of work that we all do is far too often nationally um, isolated, and I think that's a, a result of how philanthropy works, it's a result of the history of civil society organizations and volunteerism, it's a result of where our national identities come from, but I think it doesn't have to be that way because we're largely dealing with similar legal systems and the idea of international norms is one that's clearly increasing, and that trend is only uh, given more power by the, by the fact that we're using the same technologies. We're trying to make the same sort of interventions for the most part in very different contexts. It's often the same discussion. So what we're doing here, coordinating and sharing stories, I think is gonna be going to become a much bigger part of what government reform means. Um, so these are some of the things that Sunlight has been involved in, the Money Politics Transparency Project, opening parliament um, that Maria talked about that we've collaborated on. Many of us have worked together on, on that, so probably some of you here. The Fight 215, I think that's just in the U.S., but that's, that's about the surveillance reform movement. And there are many, many other things like that. And that's part of what makes uh, PDF so special, is to be able to meet a like-minded group um, of people working on the same issues through a community perspective. So I think that's a super valuable component of what's here. And that's part of why one of the things I wanted to end on is the idea that, that OGP, the Open Government Partnership, um, despite all of its flaws, and there are, there are flaws, is, is a valuable uh, 
piece of, it's, a, it's an opportunity for governments and for civil societies to try to push the conversation forward. So maybe that's something that the Polish government should, should, should consider joining or Polish civil society should consider being a part of the over, open government par partnership because there's a global conversation happening uh, trying to push governments into doing, doing better work. Um, and that's something that is complicated and occasionally allows richer governments to cast openness in their own image, but that's an opportunity for us too, for all of us to try to move our governments forward through shame or inspiration or whatever works, uh, because we have a, a lot of work to do, as you all said. And, and again, I, I just want to say thanks for allowing me to be here and sharing some of my thoughts for you, with you and getting to meet you all, and for the amazingly inspiring example of your experiences. So thanks very much. <laughs>